Ave Maria. At that time, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And when the angel had come to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. When she heard him, she was troubled at his word and kept pondering what manner of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace with God. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he shall be king over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How shall this happen, since I do not know man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you, and therefore the Holy One to be born shall be called Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your kinswoman, also has conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing shall be impossible with God. But Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. Today we celebrate the feast of the most holy name of Mary. The feast is about 500 years old. On the 13th of September, in the year um, 1215, there was a victory won over the heretics, the Albigensians, Manichaeans, and this was a heresy that denied the goodness of creation. The, they taught that matter was evil, and they tried to live as if they were angels. In essence, it's a rejection of God's creation, a declaration that there is another God as powerful as, the God, as God, and that there was a good God and an evil God. But also, it was a denial of the Incarnation. This victory over the Abigensians was won by Simon de Montfort, of course, who is well known, a great devotee of Our Lady, and it was under the banner of Our Lady that he won the victory. In the 16th, in 16th century, about 1515, the Spanish, um, one of the, the towns, had a devotion to the holy name of Mary. And this spread throughout Spain until it became a feast partic um, peculiar to Spain and the Spanish provinces. So this would be the mid-16th century. Sometime later, in fact in, in um, September of 1683, the Turks had surrounded Vienna, and they were threatening to overwhelm the city with the intention, in fact, if they had captured Vienna, all of Europe would have been opened to them. The situation was desperate. Even the emperor had given up hope, and he left Vienna. However, in Poland, there was uh, one Sobieski who led an army to go and relieve the siege of Vienna. He set out on the Feast of the Assumption. 
And he arrived at the gates of Vienna unexpectedly with a very small army. But he took the Turks by surprise and defeated some 300,000 of them. The date, of course, was the 12th of September, 1683. And it was this victory that gives us the, 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 the today's feast, the most holy name of Mary, which was then spread by, was, just in, was then um, inscribed in the Roman um, Missal. And it was placed on the Sunday within the octave of the Nativity. It would later be removed to this present date, the date, in fact, of one Sobieski's victory. Later, the, in the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, the feast would be removed altogether, as was the feast of the Most Holy Name of Jesus. But the two feasts were restored by Pope John Paul II um, in 2002. So we have the Feast of the Most Holy Name of Jesus on the 3rd of January and um, today's feast. In the Gospel, we encounter the name of the Virgin for the first time when the angel comes from heaven. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So at the very beginning of our salvation or the, the actual implementation of our salvation, we find our Blessed Lady's name. And we find her name also in the Gospel um, according to St. John at the beginning of our Lord's missionary life. And the angel came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And the virgin is troubled by these words because this is really quite an extraordinary salutation. Full of grace is the first time we encounter this expression. To be full of grace is the same as being full of the Holy Spirit. The angel had said the same thing about John the Baptist to Zechariah, his father. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And considering that St. Luke is the one who wrote this gospel, as well as the one who wrote the Acts of the Apostles, we can trace that same expression, expressions, hail full of grace and full of the Holy Spirit, in his second work, the, the Acts of the Apostles. In the Acts of the Apostles, in the sixth chapter, we're told that the Apostles, this is after the confusion about the widows, who was looking after the widows and who was not, and the favoring of one over the other, the apostles decided to choose seven men whom they would um, ordain as deacons to look after the temporal needs of the community. And we're told that these were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we're told in the next chapter that Stephen was full of grace. And we also told the same thing about the other deacons who had been chosen, full of grace. Now, we can only be filled to our maximum capacity. So two vessels may be of different size, but both of them can be filled. In the case of our Blessed Lady, she had the greatest capacity to contain God's grace, God's favor. 
So great was her capacity that she could conceive our Savior first and foremost in her heart. Conceiving him in her heart, the natural extension is that she would likewise can be found worthy to conceive him in her womb. And this, in fact, is what the angel is expressing to us, that he had come from heaven, he had come from God's throne itself. He had already identified himself um, when he appeared to Zechariah in the temple. I'm Gabriel, one of those who stand in before the throne of God. And so here he's come with this message from God himself. And when the virgin hears him, she's troubled, pondering, not saying a word, being troubled by the greeting, to which the angel puts her, her mind to rest. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace with God. And so he pronounces her most blessed name, that I'm speaking to you, to you directly, for you have found grace with God. This is in contrast to the angel who attempted to steal, to take this grace by force. In other words, the angel thought that he could redeem himself by his own um, powers, by his own natural ability. Nor was she like our first parents, Adam and Eve, who thought they could achieve their happiness, their salvation, by theft, which is what they did. No, in her case, she is like the man who was plowing, and he came across this treasure, he found it. She's like the merchant looking for fine pearls and found it. And what she found is nothing other than God's favor. And the supreme gift that could be given to her is nothing other than to be the mother of God. And so when we invoke the name of Mary, we need constantly to be mindful of this. For the heaven he left, he found heaven in her. This is what um, Father Faber um, declared in his famous hymn. And so likewise for us, we can find heaven if we find the Virgin first. We will find our Savior if we find his mother, as did the shepherds, and indeed as did the wise men. So whatever our condition, let us seek the star of the sea, which is the meaning of Our Lady's name. She's the star of the sea because in the troubles of this world, she shines in the darkness. So whatever the storms of life bring, let us turn to her trustfully and ask in her, Sweet Mary, star of the sea, pray for us and guide us to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is Lord forever and ever. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit.